Club, where ordinary parents encourage one another to develop an extraordinary appreciation of math. We love what we know and struggle over the unfamiliar. Through weekly conversation and exploration among friends, we can begin to enjoy ideas that seem difficult. Join our book club as we discover how math helps us to know God and to make him known. Hi, I'm Lee Bortons, and it's Wednesday, February 14th, 2024. Happy Valentine's Day. Welcome to the Math Math Book Club, where Kirsty Gilpin and I discuss two lessons each week from our soon-to-be-released math curriculum for families with students in classical conversations communities. And I love that introduction where it says where friends can get together and discuss, because now that we've been getting together for over a year, I really do feel like a lot of you that I've never actually got to you know physically meet are my friends, and I just really appreciate all your contributions. So Kirsty, great job leading them, and what do you have for us this week? Well, we are looking at uh, lessons 11 and 12, and hopefully today looking at that from a uh, first grade uh, or six-year-old perspective, we are really going to be feeling restful about these topics. Um, I think that uh, when families dive into these, they're, they're going to see some of the real depth and meat that we offer uh, mathematically in the math map. So, um, as always, just like we do for our students, we're opening up each week with a, an image of the math map, reminding you that we are working through the naturals. And this week we are looking at 11 and 12. And I know that there are a couple of lingering questions from last week. And so we actually are going to address those first. And so one of the questions that we're was left from last week was talking about the frames. So the, for those of you who have seen uh, the uh, complex curriculum, uh, complete, the complete curriculum, know that there's a lot more in those booklets than just the lesson pages. Um, we have the charts and, uh, and these frames, and they're there to help put the lesson into context. So I'm going to just show everybody an image of these and then talk about how might you look at this at home. So the first of our frames is every week, uh, there is indeed a copy of the math map. And that copy of the math map is in there to encourage you with your students to say, okay, where are we on our math journey? Uh, what domain are we in? And what lesson are we working on? Uh, so that's the, one of the really big ideas, um, you know, as Lee talks about the math map, she's really worked very hard to uh, make the curriculum clear to parents where they are in their mathematics journey so that they can easily look back and see what has been um, accomplished and look ahead to see where they're going. Um, and by seeing these patterns, we hope that families are going to really feel that they are equipped and empowered to direct math education in their home. Uh, and so that's why it's so important every week to really stop and say, okay, where are we on our journey? Um, and that's why the math map is there each week. The next of our frames we call our I squared uh, invention page. And the goal of this page is to look at that topic multidimensionally. Uh, so we, we did used to call this our across the dimensions page to really emphasize that idea that we could pull together ideas from across the dimensions. So for example, as you look at this page here, um, and you'll notice it's gold, I'm pulling these from our uh, the, the complex level, um, although the plan is that for a challenge, they will all be the same. Um, you'll see here we have um, information that was pulled from lesson four and in that these are looking again at 1D limits and then looking at 2D limits. So we're trying to pull um, across the weeks, across the lessons, across the dimensions, how these ideas um, tie together. We're calling it invention because our goal is to really encourage you to use this page to um, dive in and ask, what do you know? Um, all right, to help your students self-assess what they may know about this one topic. And so the tutors are equipped every week with some common topic questions, as well as a tell me everything you know question. And certainly parents can do the same at home. 
in the companion, we'll have more information um, about these pages and some suggestions for parents that want to use these at home. Again, as I talk through all of these pages, um, there is no one way to work through these booklets. So some families, uh, their first year through the math map may not discuss these pages at home. They may leave that for the tutor to discuss in community. Other families may dive in deeply to these pages. Uh, it's really going to depend on each family as to figuring out what's the best fit for your family. So that is our invention page again. Kirsty, I want to add just for clarity, it's saying, you, you said that very well, it's just a different way of saying it. This is almost like a cheat sheet on limits because we taught limits in arithmetic in week four and then limits on a line in nine and then <laughs> limits um, uh, you know, in two-dimensional space at different places. And the charts are designed so that to help the parent or older tutor know for that lesson, this is what you need to know. But then things apply all over the place. So where is a place it's summarized by topic? And that's what this frame page does also. Um, and going along with that, um, that idea of summarizing and putting putting things together in a different way. Um, the sister page to that invention page is our I cubed memoria and arrangement page. And the goal of that is to take, again, as Lee said, the charts have all of that grammar for that lesson and how we try to lay that out so that you can see how ideas uh, interconnect. But then when we pull some of that information out and we're identifying it as grammar in our flashcards, it's really out of context, right? We're just memorizing um, the information. The memoria and arrangement page then tries to take that grammar and put it into context. And so uh, these are facing pages in the booklet. So they work together uh, for tutors in community. And again, families at home can use these um, as a way to sort of highlight some things that maybe would be your first pass at memorizing information, but it also takes information and summarizes it in a different way to what is on the charts. Uh, just to, to continue to give families as many tools as we can so that you can customize and tailor this program for your students. Um, so I'll say, I want to add more to, to, so almost think of this as an essentials chart of what students could memorize. So for instance, these are the 16 functions and they're the only 16 functions you'll ever see in kindergarten through high school mathematics. And they're all on one page, but they are practiced and taught in different ways and in different sections throughout the curriculum. So once you, you know, your child's in high school, you're going to want to say to them, I know it feels hard to you, but look, it's all on the one page here. Just memorize it and see if that makes your life any easier. So these are tools, not necessarily activities, but you could make it an activity. You could make it you know, copy it or um, uh, inter intertwine it with the flashcards that also will help them with the memory work related to functions. So that's our, those two pages. So um, the working together, the invention, and then the memoria and arrangement page. And remember, what is our goal as classical educators in our uh, primary and secondary education in our primary and secondary home schools? We are aiming to teach the classical skills of learning using great um, grammar, using great academic material. And so by using those words invention and memoria and arrangement, we're really trying to help the parent and the tutor to emphasize for those students, right? So here's your tools of invention. When we ask you the question, tell me everything you know about limits, well, how do you know everything you know? Just like an Annie chart, right? We're asking those comparison and definition questions. Then when we look at this, and as Lee pointed out, right, it's like a, a chart of things to memorize. Um, and how, why does, why is it arranged this way? What does the arrangement tell us, right? So we're, we're encouraging our students to be con continually coming back and emphasizing those skills of learning, but we're trying to give parents and tutors the tools um, in order to do that. Here's one more thing I want to say is you'll see these same um, two, I, two, I, I1, I2, and I3 pages in the naturals in the lower domains. And um, and one way it might cause some frustration for a, younger, a parent of younger children because they're like, why is this in here? I'm not doing this. 
But remember, we also have an audience of mathematicians who love math and aren't familiar with the math map. And it's a way to reassure them that we've got you covered. They are going to be covering these concepts. You may not see them the way you expect to in naturals or fractions, but it's all coming and it's all mapped in a way that will build towards this. I see a lot of smiles. Thank you. <laughs> and then our fourth, um, our fourth page of the frame. So there's, um, again, we call them the frames because they physically uh, frame the lesson pages. There's three at the front, the math map, invention and memoria are at the front of the booklet. And our fourth one, careful calculations is at the back of the booklet. So they physically frame it. But um, just like when you have a piece of art, it is enhanced by the frame around it. Um, that frame right, helps you to put that piece of art into context in a way um, because you, you now see it, it stands out from the wall that it's hanging on. And so that's what these frames are there to do. And so that uh, careful calculations page, uh, you may notice that that looked very similar to um, the, memoria and arrangement page that we just talked about. Um, and um, this time uh, we have some fill in the blanks here. So they're going to become familiar with these ideas, but this time through activity. And so in this case, the activity is to substitute in these values. Um, and as they substitute in the values, they can see what the parent equation is. Right. So it's still grammar exercise where we, we may not even really understand what a general equation and a parent equation are, but we're emphasizing practicing substitution. And then they're going to start recognizing patterns that may help them to define for themselves what general and parent equation are. And so these careful calculations pages are designed to be um, somewhat uh, calculation emphasizing, right? They're, they're calculation emphasis uh, of these, pulling some key kind, key ideas out of the lessons. And they're here, um, they can be a review, they can be a quiz or a test. Um, so again, it's one more tool that parents have in their arsenal that they can use with their students to make sure that they're getting that repetition that they need on certain key topics. So those are our frames and how you may use those at home. Then um, as we look below that, uh, the other thing that we talked about last week was that idea of tailoring the curriculum. And it's probably difficult for most families to tailor um, a conventional math curriculum so that they can be on the same topic and yet progressing at their own um, level. And one of the things that we're really trying to do is make it possible for CC communities and for CC families to all be discussing the same lesson every week while also meeting the needs of their students. So we are giving families and tutors the, op the ways that they can tailor this curriculum. Um, they can use the arts of the grammar, the dialectic and the rhetoric to approach these lessons um, at their um, at their preferred level, right? At their preferred um, depth. Abilities, maybe. And abilities, yes. Yeah. So one way you can do that is by uh, really focusing on flashcards and emphasizing the flashcards. Um, that is the grammar out of context, but we all know that the better we know our grammar, the better we are at engaging in more work. Uh, we do that in Latin, right? The more that I know my vocabulary in Latin, the easier it is to translate. I don't have to go and look up um, every single word. And so that, that's the idea behind the flashcards is loading that grammar so that the rest of it becomes more approachable. Um, other ways that you could tailor this at home include changing the page order, um, emphasizing just the page tops, looking at the solutions as copy work. So, um, right. We know that we learn when we copy. So you can look at that solutions page as copy work. You can incorporate other domains. So perhaps your student um, is not quite ready to do calculations at the complex level. And so you want to use the comp uh, computations and calculations from the fractions level. They're still going to be looking at the same big ideas, but um, 
at a computational level that is maybe perhaps more appropriate. And we also um, right, encourage our students to go deeper uh, so we can look at exploring those charts and um, what, what's familiar in those charts, right? So going through those with our students and saying, what is it that's familiar to you? Um, is there something on here that intrigues you that you want to know more about? Um, using those charts as memory work, looking for those connections, right? Um, so again, as uh, for my, my students who maybe are very much loading the grammar, using those um, skills from, uh, uh, from grammar, right? So our names and attending and memorizing and expressing and storytelling well. For our students who are, who are ready to ask a few more questions, encouraging them to use those common topics, right? To engage in the material. And then certainly for our students who, who are perhaps really confident in a particular topic, right? Encouraging them to, to then turn around and teach it or explain it to somebody else. And that may change from week to week. So we may have students who um, were very confident in arithmetic and less confident in geometry. Or we may have students who are less confident uh, with calculating, but they just really love uh, polygons, right? So that's what those uh, classical skills are going to allow us to do to really meet the needs of our students. And we want families to feel equipped and empowered to use the math map to meet the needs of those students. So that way we can all be talking about um, for this, for example, this week curved lines, um, even if we're doing it at the level that's most appropriate for us individually. So any questions on any of that? That was a lot, but Kirsty, thanks for running through that. And I think it was Nicole that asked about it last week. Nicole, did that answer your questions? Good. Yes, thank you so much. It really does help to, I think the question I asked was how to use the frames at home mm -hmm. and then how to take, how, how to keep the kids at their same, you know, how to make sure that we're not losing the freedom of letting kids move at their own pace mm -hmm. while also trying to keep them all on the same subject on the same week, right? On the same topic, I should say. So yeah, that was really helpful because I think scaling and then remembering that like essentials, it's coming around again and again and again is, um, that was very helpful. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump into our lessons for this week. And we are looking at lesson 11 and it is open shapes, curved lines that we're looking at. And um, let's go ahead and I'm gonna jump into a couple of questions for you as you look here. Um, what three cases of the base are we comparing on this page? So look at that, those top three sections there. And, and as you look at comparatively, what three things are we comparing? Direction. Okay, so great. So as we're looking at the graph, you notice the direction of the graph changes. Good. There's less than, greater than, and equal to. Great. So as we look at the, the three different cases of our bases, we're looking at the base being between zero and one, the base being one, or the base being greater than one. And how do those um, ideas maybe connect to the idea of decay being stable or growing, and then also to those graphs. Mm. Hmm. So whoever it was that said the direction of the graph, as we look at the direction of the graph for the top one, as I go from left to right, Am I growing or am I decaying? Decay. Decay, right? It's, it's getting less each time. And so if I think about my base between zero and one, does that fit? If you think about something as, as being multiplied by one half each time, does that make sense that it would be getting less? Mm. 
what kind of change happens in that middle one? Jill's shaking her head. There's no change, right? Does that make sense if I'm multiplying by one each time? Yep. Right? And that would be my stable case, right? There's nothing, there's nothing happening. You're okay. saying stable what? Case. Uh, case. C A S. There's three cases on here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then at the bottom, am I growing or decaying? Growing. I'm growing. And does that make sense if I'm multiplying by more than one each time? That I would grow. Mm -hmm. Would you so, be talking about multiplication with a six-year-old? So yes, right. They they have that six-year-old has gone through and they've done multiplication and they've done exponents, right? They've seen lessons on those. So they have the grammar, they may not understand. And in this case, if I'm looking at this page with my six-year-old, um, I may not be saying, this is what's happening. You're multiplying by one each time, right? It's grammar work, but I might want to say, look, when it's greater than one, it's going up. When it's equal to one, it's steady. When it's less than one, it's going down. I may help them to make those memoria connections, but it's really just grammar, right? And so um, it's tracing, it's just becoming familiar with the notation. But I wanted to have that conversation with us because as parents, right, we can access um, we can access that understanding. Or if we have older students that are looking at these naturals pages, right? I want to point out how it may feel like, oh, this was designed for six-year-olds, but there's still a lot of learning and connecting that our 16-year-olds could make, right? Just by using those uh, skills of learning, those comparison and definition, right? So even though it's tracing, I can still have that conversation with my older student um, to help them make those connections. Something that might ask. help too is that um, the part that's the tracing is for the kids. Those other words and symbols are there for you as you have older children, because your older children are going to have f of x equals an equation with a base that's between zero and one. And it's just to help you make those connections. So for every kid, you're, for every student, you're gonna have to figure out, like, you know, is this literally something to talk about or is this something to just start looking at? And Kirstie's right, those images are always usually things almost any age could talk about, up and down, right and left, constant, stable. And that's why, do you remember on some of the bottom pages, it says, talk about the images, discuss the words, discuss the symbols. It's to remind you not to do all of it at once, but to keep trying as your children are interested to, you know, keep referring to those three ideas that represent math. All right. Let's go ahead and look at page two. And, and I, I wanted to emphasize on this page here, right? Exactly what we just talked about. If you look at this middle section, um, let's see if I can get this right. So look at this middle here. What are the natural students practicing? Writing the letter reading. N. Yeah. Reading right. math sentences. That's it, right? All they're doing is becoming familiar with this notation. Um, and they may not know what that notation means, right? But they're becoming familiar with writing, right? By copying it, we're becoming familiar with what this notation looks like, and that's it, right? So we, we're emphasizing this notation, this notation. But the parent or the older student, right? As they read this, can they learn something different? Why don't you take a minute to compare the first set of numbers that begins with zero and the next set of numbers that begins with negative one beneath it? What's the difference between them? Someone's oh, typewriter is loud. Um, the difference is one is a naturals 
set and the other one is um, real numbers. Is that correct? Z real numbers? Uh, Z is actually integers. That's integers. a good guess though. Because they are real numbers. They're just a subcategory. Yep. So I was going to say that. Oh, sorry. I was going to say that that I was going to say the absolute value of the numbers in one and three are both getting bigger. OK, good. So there's some, so there's a lot of patterns that we could look at uh, on this page um, and really just enjoy um, as we look at those, we could just enjoy looking at all the patterns that we notice. Um, and so there's a perfect example with uh, one level of student, perhaps all I wanna talk about is these are natural numbers, and these are integers. Maybe then I could talk about what's the difference between these are positive and negative. These are positive and negative. Oh, these are rational numbers, right? So now I'm talking about these are rational numbers. And then the, I could then step up and add in another piece of grammar that the index of any of these terms has to be one of these choices, right? So when we look at this um, with polynomials and, uh, and power sums, these are my four choices. So there's a layering of grammar that we can get from this page um, and our youngest students, all that they're all they're looking at is becoming familiar with that notation. But we're, as Lee pointed out, we want you as the parent or that older student to have the context to see where this fits into where we're going. So charity, it there really isn't, um, I think, a reason. It's um, why they're going from lesser to greater or greater to lesser. I think it just happened to be the way they were written. All right, let's look at page three. And I'm gonna give you a minute to think through what's familiar and unfamiliar on this page and um, perhaps think through those two questions. What form does a rational number have? And then what form does a rational function have? So go ahead and share what feels familiar and what feels unfamiliar, or if you wanna talk about um, the connection between rational numbers and rational functions. Well, this is very basic, but I recognize the word ratio and I recognize the word rational. And I know as a child, I never put those two things together. And so it was, it's like a light bulb moment. Oh, a rational number is one, like a, it's one that can be written as a ratio. That's, that's so basic. An irrational number can't be written as a, as a ratio. And that's, I love how you did that. So. That's exactly what my kids got really excited about um, when we did this page. Well, that's great. When we slow down and look at the language, it it can help us, can't it? <laughs> you mean the words matter? <laughs> it's just they're math words, so they're scary and nobody needs to know them and nobody uses them, so we overlook them. You know, and you know, when we have that kind of attitude, I noticed in myself, and that was where my, my expansion of my appreciation of math and the Bible came together, is when I, I would like go, I would gloss over the genealogy, or I would gloss over the description of the temple, or I would gloss over, and it was because, really, arrogance. I didn't want to take the time to study and know it, but it was because those things are not familiar to me, and I would go right to what is familiar. And so that is why we keep saying familiar and unfamiliar on this page, because everyone who is autodidactic teaches something to themselves. They always go for what they know. And then if they have time and energy, they look at what they don't know. And that is just a natural way all of us learn. But some children, some adults are perfectionists. And if they don't know everything at once, they get really handicapped. And so this is why it's really important that we keep saying, okay, just do what you what's familiar to you on the page first. Please block out all the other things because you got to build confidence also. I think what you said there 
um, reminds me a lot of when at one of the math camps when you talked about reading math out loud and that's something that you know we've mentioned lots of times on these calls but that it does give us a chance to without having to go deep on all the meanings but our children get to hear these words we get to hear these words it takes some of the mystery out and then it does become more familiar it doesn't remain unfamiliar to us forever and we didn't have to um not let our children see it like we don't hold back the king james from our children just because they can't we read it and we keep going and so just to read rational and look at the image and first of course we're going to look at the pennies and the cats and the you know the other things that are familiar to us but reading that math at just for the skill of reading it gave me a lot of rest and a lot of peace and not only did that in a way tailor less but it also tailored more because we were unfamiliar with it and it exercised some new muscles for us it's good Jill. and i i love that i'm seeing just looking at this i'm seeing how we can be using this in our saxon texts like as a challenge for you know to parent i'm looking at saxon right now and i see how i can use these things and how i can pay attention to words better but I'm so excited to have a tool that guides me through the process of doing that because sometimes it does feel really hard. So this, this is wonderful. Great. And I love, I just wanna, um, I love that um, Melba pointed out, right? She was looking at graphs. And so here's a really big idea uh, for this week is that, all of these equations that we have, right? When we have two variables and all of these equations can have a graph that goes with them, right? And, and I think that's something that as mathematicians, we just assume that um, as high school math teachers, right? They just assume that they say, okay, well, here's its graph. But that's the really big idea is that every different function that we have, have a different graph, right? And so we're going to be able to talk about, um, right? So we look at that middle, sort of lower middle part there where it says traces and it says rises left, falls right. And we see these different things that graphs can do and we're getting this language to talk about those graphs. And as we do that, um, and then if we notice that as we look, I'm gonna go back a page and then we're gonna go forward a page, right? Notice here it was the constant function now it's the rational function and here is a radical function um, and so as we look at these different functions they all have different graphs right and so there's the there's a big idea um, that comes out of this lesson right? and so just like in that last um the last page we did we said ratio right we talk we know what a ratio is and then we feel oh that's a rational number is a fraction it can be written as a ratio and so oh a rational function uh, has a, a numerator and a denominator right it can be written as a ratio or as a fraction here right what symbol defines a radical function it has a radical sign in it <laughs> is it called a radicant no 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 wow. you're right it is it's the radical sign yep okay the rest so that and radical... the radicans underneath right is that okay. what you're saying john janet the radicans underneath yes okay okay and so again i'm just i've just put that uh, encouragement that as we are doing this with our younger students and they're tracing right that they're again they're just tracing that there's these um, what symbols, and they're not really going to understand what we mean by f of x equals the second root of g of x cubed, right? They're not necessarily going to understand that, um, but they can trace that and become familiar with that notation, and they can become familiar with these graphs so that over time, right, as we build, we're, we're hammering in our pegs, and then we're going to start connecting them uh, to help them build their understanding 
But certainly if we look at this with an older student, and I keep coming back to that for all those families that we keep saying, please, please, please go through this with your student uh, before they begin challenge A next year, right? If you have a rising challenge A student that will be in the complex, the best thing that you can do to prepare is to work through the naturals. And I want you to see that if you're working through these with your older students, there's a lot on here that they're going to learn. So at first glance, it might feel like tracing and copy work and matching, but there's grammar and notation and, and big ideas that they walk away from these pages with. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna take a brief break um, and um, just remind you of our release schedule and what is coming. And I want to give you a minute to ask any questions that are, are lingering that we haven't been able to hit yet. You know, one thing- Kirstie, that... somebody was talking, oh, sorry. Somebody was asking about the travel log. I answered that up above. Oh, you did? Okay. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, I'll be happy. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Carrie. Um, I just have a question. I, I, I do have my son coming up into Challenge A next uh, year. Do I print out naturals to go through with him before he um, starts using complex? Or do we, when you say run through it with your, your child, um, do we do it on on the computer or do I just hit print and it will print? Okay. It, it is, it is printable. Yes. And so that is a resource that you can print and use at home um, so that your student actually has that opportunity to work through those pages. There is a version on there, uh, depending on um, whether you feel like you need the big pages, there is a version uh, that we've made available that has four pages of the naturals per page that would cut down on printing cost. Um, and since it's such a big font, um, it obviously makes it a little bit, uh, probably more age appropriate to do it smaller, um, but that's up to you. We just wanna make sure that you know that both of those are um, accessible to you. And, and Kirsty, I would say I've been working with my 12 year old through the naturals this year, and I haven't been printing it because honestly, I mean, he could trace the stuff and circle the, but it's, it's pretty basic, but we just look at it on the computer and talk through each page. We do four pages a day. And I mean, that's, I feel like that's an option um, because it's working really well for our first layer. Yeah, I've been telling parents, especially when the parents or older students are doing it, is do what you need to do on the digital. But when you get to that one or two pages where you're going, huh, print a couple of those out because some of it is just so easy. But for instance, those rational and radicals, there's no real calculation to do, but you might want to print a couple of those kind of pages just so your older child truly says it out loud and maybe does copy the graph to start getting the grammar um, internalized. So, and that's again why what Chrissy said at the beginning. We've tried. We are all homeschool moms and dads that wrote this curriculum. There's ten of us. Half of them actually were homeschooled students, and we have just thought over and over again about all the things we like to do and don't like to do, and our you know abilities of our children and the cost of paper and all those things. Trying to give as many options as possible, and that by itself may cause problems because like people who are used to just page turning and use the book, have, let the book use them instead of use the book themselves, will probably struggle with how many options they have at first. And this is why we have tutors in community so that they can show them various ways. And what I always loved about tutoring is I'd get to know my students. And so I could say to you know one of them, for example, I'm making this up, obviously I never did this, but I could did this in Latin and other things. I could say to them, honey, I just need you to do the tops this week or you should be doing your careful calculation page, you're getting really good at this. And to help them hear and see from another voice how they can get a little bit better each week. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, that's a good idea, Jill. And I just, I was just jump in because um, this was something that I, I had the opportunity to speak with some families a couple of weeks ago. And the question came up about the curriculum being designed to be consumable. Um, and 
we really want to emphasize, again, even though it's consumable, it is up to each family to determine how best to, to use the curriculum at home. We uh, created a consumable resource because you can take that consumable resource and choose how to use it at home. You can use page protectors, you can write on a separate piece of paper um, if you want to be able to reuse that resource. Um, but if we had created a one, nobody really wants another two inch thick book of um, work. But if we had created a book, it that you can't take that and make it consumable. You can't take that and chop it up into pieces and take it to the beach with you. So we really wanted to make something that was very accessible, very self-contained, very portable, um, that gave parents and families the maximum flexibility in how to use the resources at home. All right, so I, I think that this is a great time to talk about the fact that in lesson 11, we're talking about curved lines. We're talking about all these different functions that we have, exponential functions, logarithmic functions, all of our different power functions. And for many, it's going to feel like there's a lot of big ideas um, to wrestle with, especially as students get um, older. Then we get to lesson 12. And I think a lot of people will breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief because it's going to feel more familiar to them. Um, we're gonna be talking about polygons. And so as, as we look at the flow throughout the year, Lee has been very intentional in giving weeks where you're gonna be wrestling with material followed by weeks that are going to feel more restful. And so it's not always a slog um, right, that we, we have these periods where the topics are going to feel a little bit more restful, a little bit more accessible. Um, and I wanted to encourage you also that if you are working through the curriculum and you hit a rough, uh, I, should I keep going? Please do, because I guarantee you that there is something restful around the corner. Yeah, weeks 11 and 18 are the worst. And then after that, it's week seven, which is why it has those nice bunnies on the cover try to make it better so if you can get those three lessons mastered with your kid they are going to be so good in high school math and college math all right so let's take a look at this page and um share either share what's familiar or what is unfamiliar and then um when would poly be gone and how does that help you know what the definition of a polyga is polygon is When the gate is left open, Polly can go <laughs> and be gone. <laughs> How does that help us know what the definition of a polygon is? We have to know that it's closed. Excellent, right? We, it's a closed shape, so that's gonna help us. And that definition is there on the page, right? That a polygon is a closed shape with straight sides. Is there any this page that is unfamiliar to anybody? That complex in the tracing part, that complex looks weird. And I never thought of a rectangle as being convex. I would have thought of concave things, but I would have never thought to go ahead and call that convex and begin getting that vocabulary in. Great. Vertex was also unfamiliar to me. Can you tell what it is by this picture? Does it give you a clue? It looks like a V. <laughs> looks like That's yeah, the corner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and, and a lot of times, you see, we didn't do a gray line on the first one. I would pick sometimes the hardest of the words or the least familiar to do the gray clue on, thinking most parents know what a side and a diagonal are. All right. Let's go ahead and look at page two. And notice it says triangle analysis. Um, 
So we're looking at triangles on this page. And here's a, here's a challenge question for you. What operation is used for perimeter and what operation is used for area? Well, perimeter, you generally add the sides and then area. I always tell the kids we're, we're going to put a carpet down so you have to multiply the sides. Good. So by comparing these two ideas, right, we've got um, add and perimeter, so we're adding, and then we've got our multiplication and our area, we can see that those different operations are going to give us different measures of our triangle, right? So even just the grammar of, of connecting those two ideas is helpful. Let's go ahead and look at the next page. Um, how about this page? What about things that are familiar or unfamiliar on this page? I see inequalities. Or is that an inequality? Intersection. Good. What would you call it, Kirsty? What would you, I don't know this. What would you call the congruence and similarity symbol? Would you call them inequalities also? Um, You're stumping us. You guys are so smart. They're, they're comparison symbols. I don't know that I would say it's an inequality, but it's definitely a comparison symbol, right? We're comparing uh, the two segments. Mm -hmm. But see, we don't expect you to know what they are, what they mean, or why they're there. It's just a trace. It's to get used to, you know, seeing what's in front of you on these unusual symbols. Now, how many uh, quadrilaterals are on that top portion of the page? All of them are. So how many? Right, so think about your six-year-old. What's a great activity, right, just to count them? So if we counted, how many quadrilaterals would we have? Four. That's so we pretty have, Right, we might have four. If we looked at that whole top section between the, the colored bars, how many would we have? Seven. Seven. Seven, right? So we can sit there just with our students and just count, right? How many are in this section? How many are in this section, right? How many all together? Um, now here's another question for you. How many regular quadrilaterals are there? Just one, uh, two. I think there's just one. Is That's that a rhombus at the top? Oh, regular. The, it, the may second be, one? it may be a rhombus, but the only one that is regular is the oh, square. Because the of square. the angles. I was thinking yeah. the sides needed yep. to be, but it has to be, the angles have to all be the same too. That's right. Yep. So there's three on the page. <laughs> unless, unless you count each one of those at the bottom as separate polygons. Right. 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 I mean, I isn't like that a... Isn't that, so there we go. So there's the obvious stuff that we're supposed to do here with tracing and becoming familiar with the notation, but, but we can just use the page and have a great conversation about what a quadrilateral is, what's a regular quadrilateral, which are squares, which are rectangles, um, right? And so we really wanna just, I just wanted to point that out that there's so much we can do with our students beyond just the tracing. You know, if we stop and we just say, let's talk about this page. Let's count how many squares there are. Let's count how many quadrilaterals there are. Um, and doing that is going to help them to form their own definition. So even if we don't ever tell them um, that the square is the regular quadrilateral and why, if we just counted the squares and they saw the, the square at the top, the two big squares at the bottom and then all the little squares at the bottom, right? We're helping them to start seeing that pattern of what is a square, right? What's a rectangle and what's not. All right, and let's look at page four. 
and um, I, go ahead and tell me what, what looks familiar and what looks unfamiliar on this page. Seeing those squares for area of the, like the bars looks very familiar from different manipulatives we've used. That's great, Jill. So your kids, right, when they see that, they start going, oh, we're talking about area, right? That's, that's a good hint as to what we're talking about. And all the, the ever objects. objects on the right. Mm -hmm. I think the most unfamiliar thing for my six-year-old when they were six would have been the triangles in the square at the top. And then the, you know, 2m squared plus 3m squared, those things. That notation looks harder than it is, right? It looks overwhelming. But when we read it, and that's, that's always been my argument with fractions, right? If we read them out loud, a lot of times fractions are a lot more accessible when we read them out loud, right? When we look at them visually, they can feel really overwhelming. But if we read it, if I said to you, um, add two meters squared and three meters squared, right? I can say, okay, well, if I had two ice cream cones and three ice cream cones, well, I'd have five ice cream cones. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about two meters squared and three meters squared. Well, that would just be five meters squared, right? When we read it out loud, it becomes accessible because now we're thinking words instead of symbols. And so it's one of the reasons why Lee is urging, right? Read it out loud, read it out loud, uh, because then we're making those connections between the words and the symbols, right? If we just look at it and we're not reading it out loud, a lot of times we don't read it in here either and we just look at the symbols. And if you're not familiar with the symbols, they can feel very overwhelming. And so reading things out loud is one way to help make the connection between the symbols and the words. So and to me, this is another giggle problem for in the car with the little ones to say to them, what's two plus three? And then what's three plus two? And then what's two feet plus three feet? And what are three meters? And then you know, we work way into the tens and the hundreds. And all you're doing is reversing, but you're giving them something that they can do first and then just go kind of crazy with. And they'll start to, you know, my tray will jump in and he'll start giving me numbers in the, well, they, he makes them up. They're like billion, thousands, trillions, because he doesn't know the order of the periods at all. And it's just, they, they want to stump you as much as you want to stump them. And of course, we're making it simple and they make it hard on us. And that's the way it should be. So I did want to point out, so it says there to collect a ruler, a pencil, a marker, a crayon, a knife, a fork, and a spoon of different lengths. Right. Um, and so the idea being, you can just grab those things from your kitchen um, and then measure them and then try to make triangles. And so I wanted to point out what this is pointing us toward by first asking you, can any three objects make a triangle? So I think if wherever you are, I want you to pick three random objects that are in front of you right? And I want you to see if the three that you pick up can make a triangle. Okay. So well, they can if they're straight, right? And my oatmeal if, lid will not. Okay. That's Could I, if I, thought, if I was to like fold it in half, maybe. So think about using it as a length. So I have, for example, chapstick, a, a Nerf dart, and a stylus, right? So I picked up my three objects and so they all have a length. Do you think that these three objects can make a triangle? We should have a vote. You know, it feels like any three should be able to because so often when we use triangles, they're already made for us. But, but notice here, what happens, right, is is I'm trying to make these go end to end, and guess what? I can't, right? I don't know if you can see this. I'm gonna like, I guess I <laughs> it like disappears, right? There we go. I don't know if you can see that or not, but my stylus actually goes beyond the end 
of the other two together. My two shorter ones are not longer than my, my long one. And so my triangle just collapses when I try to make it into a triangle. So for our older students, you're going to actually see that rule that my two shorter sides have to be longer than my third side. But for my littlest ones, and let's face it, even for our older students and even for ourselves, actually taking objects and saying, which of my objects will make a triangle and which ones won't, it's, is helpful to see a physical um, example. And so that's one of the reasons why we have them doing this, right? Just pick some different objects and try to make triangles and see if they can discover um, that truth. So that's what we're pointing them towards in the, for the older students. Jill, I think that's sharing. brilliant. I, I think it's brilliant because we would say we know that. But until you experiment with it and ask that question and then lay things out, but then when they're taking some sort of standardized test lately, or not lately, but later, <laughs> and somebody gives them these three lengths and says, will two inches plus five inches plus, you know, something else that doesn't work, um, plus 20 inches, will that, will that create a triangle? And they will, they'll have experienced it. Yeah, and that experience is sometimes the thing that really makes the light bulb go off, isn't it? All right. Well, we are, look at that, we're like almost perfectly timed. So <laughs> are there lingering questions from today that you would like to ask or comments you'd like to share? Mm -hmm. With the math notations, like the sentences that we read, sometimes I've seen them in other literature read in different ways. Does the answer guide have like one way to read it or does it expose us to different ways? Like for example, real number X, or X is an element of the reals are two different ways I've seen that sentence read. And I know it doesn't make much of a difference, but as a newbie, I'm just kind of wondering if that's something in the answer guide that we would just get used to. So we, we've tried, um, so in the solutions in the booklets, you're going to, um, I know Leah's tried really hard to not have a lot of ambiguous questions um, for the solution so that she can give you the best answer there. There are some times where there may be more than one answer and we may address that in the companion. In uh, we do have what we, are, we call our audio glossary, which was just um, the suggestion of one of our great mentor tutors who came up with a list of things that she thought would be helpful to have read aloud. And so we have that available. Um, but there's only so many different things that we can do. So we've tried through the companion, through the charts, through the glossary um, to give you different ways of um, different verbiage, right? For understanding different things to see that those um, th there are more than one way of reading things. We can't always address every single one um, all the time. So some of that is here's the best case scenario or this is the best way to read things. Um, and then over time, right, as we become more familiar with the language, those other ways come in. So where there are multiple ways of reading things, we, we have tried where possible to do that. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm sure that there's a lot of things where we have not given you multiple options. Um, it doesn't mean it, it may not show up in the future, but just simply time wise, you know, we've, we've started with some and, um, and over time, right, other things may be added in. But in the glossary where there's multiple ways of, of understanding something, um, we've tried to address that there. Thank you. You know, and our eyes jump around. So like if you look at the limit problems, when we first wrote those, I had the read as probably five different ways. And one day it caught my eye and I was like, why did I do that? And because sometimes I'll read the equation first and then add the limit words in my head. And then other times I'd read the limit first, then add the equation in my head. So then I went back through and I tried to say them exactly the way Kirstie did at the charts. And so, but it's still very possible that I miss some and or there's just multiple ways of saying something. 
there are some things I will let you know. There are some things that we're trying to change the way you talk about math. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, if powers are, are an example because we all say two to the third power, um, but that is not helpful in understanding what a power is. And so we are intentionally trying to train, train you to say the third power of two. Um, but we even keep it, capture ourselves saying it the wrong way. So um, old habits. It's yeah. like how many Americans don't use the word and when they mean a decimal, they'll say uh, it was 312, which means 300.12. Zero, zero but that's not what they meant. So we've just tried really hard to say it the most precise way possible. But, you know, language is language. I'd like to just give a testimony since getting the math math complex. I've been trying to work with my challenge a student at home with it and exposing ourselves before practicum season hits. And I picked up a math literature book at the library called The Historical Problems of the Ages. It was and I I started reading through the third three chapters and I realized that if you would have given me that book in December I would have closed it in tears and just kind of been like, I can't do this. But after the three chapters, so many little nuances that I never really was aware of before became familiar and just started popping up out of the pages. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can actually read this mm -hmm. like a literature book, like a romance novel. I'm reading <laughs> math novel, like a romance novel. Mm -hmm. His first chapter was, can you square a circle? Can you make a circle with a radius that has the exact same length as one of the sides of a square? And how that problem created all of these investigations that gave us all of these different theorems in mathematics. And just in that explanation, there were so many parts that the math map gave me a vocabulary that I could actually engage with the text and understand what he was saying. And that's a short, short, short time. So I'm very encouraged by what it's done just in my awareness of math literacy. Thank you. That's a wonderful story. I really appreciate that. Yeah, that's how I felt when I started teaching myself phonics back when I was 22. I was like, all of a sudden I could read better. Like the small things matter. Yeah. When I started teaching phonics 2004. Yeah. I was convinced my son marked bag wrong because he had it as a short vowel and we're from the North. And I was like, there's no way that's a short vowel. And then I go back and I was like, do you mean we talk wrong up here? <laughs> <laughs> Great story. All right. Thank you, Kirsty. Wonderful job as usual, but our time's up. So thank you, everybody. See you next week.